How's everybody doing tonight? Excited? Worship was awesome, huh? <clears throat> I was like, my gosh, I'm losing my voice because I'm giving it all. <clears throat> That's what happens when you sing and you don't know how. <laughs> but you do it because you know that the presence of God is here. Well, today we're going to go. Who was here last Wednesday? Well, only a few. Okay, so you have, this is part two. So I'm not going to go into part one of... Uh, but our title of my message, this is part two, which I hardly do any, any series. So it's life in the midst of the mess. And people are asking, why are you saying that? Because, hey, we're in 2020. And I'm not here to repeat 2019. I don't know about you, but I have made a decision that 2019, 2018, 2017, do you want me to go all the way back? Has nothing on God and has nothing on me. And you and I get to decide because life is messy. Who's a mom here? Remember when you were having your children and you were super excited, but then when you got into the labor room, you didn't know, like, what the heck is this, right? And people, that's, I'm talking to people that didn't get epidurals. Okay, I didn't get epidural, so I don't know how that feels to be reading magazines and having company. All I know is screaming. Wanting the child to get out. But then, you know, you give life and you forget, right? Because it was so beautiful and yet so messy. So we need to embrace, and I believe really with all my heart, and I believe that this message is going to prophesy to our lives. It's 2020. We have just started a new decade. People all over the world, uh, uh, people that are in the in the prophetic movement, people that that's their, that's their official, you know, they're, they're prophets. They're all talking about vision and the vision that God has for us. And you know, that difference is that he has a different preferred picture and we have said it before, but he wants us to fix our eyes on him and see that the impossible, whatever you're going through today, I don't know what a mess um, you have made or maybe someone threw you in a dip. It doesn't matter. Even if you created your own mess, I'm going to tell you that God is willing and he is pursuing you. So this year, 2020, we don't have to like live another year, live another month. I have decided I, I'm not going to do that. But you know that choice is really hard. Because it's easy to say I am choosing, even at the end of the year when you write down all your goals, right? Like I was going through all of my goals and I only did five because I'm being realistic with me. Before I used to do 30. No, I did. Because I was one of those people, like, driven, like, my gosh. It was like, and then at the end of the year, I was sad because it was only five that I accomplished. And then, so I'm still living on five years from 20 years. You know. but, but you get it. And I'm like, we put all these things on paper because it looks good. But we need to embrace. I don't know where you are in life. But I'm going to tell you that God has called us to take things. This is that the kingdom of God and the children of God, we need to take things by force. And I have said it over and over and over. Like, I love to quote that scripture. The kingdom of heaven suffers violence. You know what violence is? It's horrible. And he's telling you the kingdom of heaven suffers violence, but the violent... I'm not going to allow the violence of the enemy in the kingdom of chaos. And I have before, many times, I allow his chaos to be lighter, uh, to be louder than my truth and what God says about you and me. And we lose our weight. And I'm here to tell you, you know, this is Wednesday night. You guys are the hard, you know, the hardcore for the church, right? You, you come here and, and I pray that one of these days those seats will be filled. So I feel like we can talk real because the gospel of God is real. People are dying. The church is actually asleep and the people in the world are dying because we refuse to commit to God. And I can say that because like I told you last Wednesday, one day I commit, another day I'm, I don't know about this. This is too hard. I thought that God is eternal and many times I put God in my own chart you should have done this by now. I have found myself in life and say, how in the hell? Because we can say that in church because there's a devil and there's a hell. But how in the hell did I get here? 
I tell you how in the hell we get into hell. It's not, it's, that's not the will of God. Life is hard and, and it's never going to get easier, but when you get stronger, what happens is when we, when we encounter opposition, when we encounter struggles, when we encounter offenses, when we encounter, you name it, whatever hurts you, when you encounter pain, we choose in those moments, you have to make a choice like, okay, what am I going to do? Am I going to go and allow this to drive me outside the faithfulness of God because he's faithful? Am I going to believe my reality? Because we all have a reality. But the truth of God is bigger than a reality. But then again, is it to say it when you're not, you're not going through pain? Is it to say it when your business is thriving? Is it to say it when your career is like soaring and you're being known everywhere? It's easy to say all those things when everything is well. And when everything is well, we don't really need faith. And we are called to live by faith daily. And remember I gave you my scripture that I'm chewing and uh, the whole year this is my scripture. Uh, I might get more tattoos, scripture here, scripture there, and you know. So when people need a hand from God, I'm just going to go read the scriptures, like whatever, right? <laughs> Choose the one that you want, right? Um, I thought I'm making fake tattoos. Just, you know, you can move it. You can, you can change, you change your mind and you learn to chew that good one. Okay, Philippians 1, 6 in the Amplified, and I read this, but I want you to read it again because this is the base and the preface of everything that I'm speaking. And he says, I am convinced and confident of this very thing, that he who has begun a good work in you will continue it, perfect it, and complete it until the day of Jesus Christ, the time of his return. Last Wednesday, I told you that he is so committed in your wholeness. He is so committed in our salvation. He is so committed to see us be free from drugs or whatever your deal is. He is so committed and he's telling you, be fully convinced because the enemy comes every day and he tries to convince us that he left us. He wants us angry at God. Have you ever been angry at God? Only me. Bless the three of you that have been angry at God. You know, sometimes we don't share it and we don't even do it in prayer because we want to be reverent, but you're not being real with God. And I believe that it's time to be real. It's, 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 it's time for to show that the gospel of Jesus Christ works for now. That salvation is for now. It's not 23 years ago. It's not five years ago. It's for today. That's what it says that the, the he, his ways is yesterday, today, and forever. He is the same. And who is our Savior? Jesus. I know it sounds very intense, right? Should I dance? <laughs> you guys are making me like, oh my gosh, what's she saying? I always say that the kingdom of God is inverted. Right? They're like upside down. Like the upside down. That whatever we believe that God is doing or is not doing, he's always behind the scenes. And because this is Wednesday night, I love you all. And one thing I have to say that something has shifted in my heart. Because I've been in a very, very hard place. And you all know, I think women that come to break, because Brave is a safe place, by the way, I'm plugging in. We're at the last of the Saturday of the month, yes. I'm preaching and I believe that I have a warning season because God spoke to me that no matter where I've been, no matter how I responded or reacted, that he's still with me and he's still willing to finish the word that he promised that he has started in my life. And I think we need hope. We need hope to believe. You know, if you're good, good for you and continue to do good. But don't just put it on you. No, do it for others. Share the goodness of God. Share what God has done in your life. Share your story. Stop being silent on your past and what God has done. I'm not saying go tell it to the No, but look for people who are in need of what you have and what God has done in your life. And I want to tell you that this year I am believing that God is opening our eyes to see beyond. God is opening our eyes to see 
the reality of our problems, that we're not afraid to, afraid to confront it, that we're not afraid to think that because my life is a mess and I've been in a mess for a while and I continue to be in a mess, you know what, God has discarded me. I'm not enough. I'm not here to tell you you're more than enough and God is willing to work with your mess and actually help you fix it. Don't be one of those people that, you know, I have, praise God, thank you, Jesus, so many years I have, you know, these wonderful ladies that come here, uh, uh, clean my house. But for me, when I started doing that, it was really hard to have someone come and clean my house. So, you know, I've had them already for almost like, I don't know, almost close to eight years, and they're a blessing to my life. But when I started, I wanted to clean before they came. <laughs> then what are you paying them? I was like, what am I doing? There I go, like, I need to look that I am organized, that I don't have. Now they come, and it's so wonderful. <laughs> they have a pile of clothes that, you know, I left there, and oh, my gosh. I should take a picture, and I'm like, I'm not ashamed. You come clean. I'm paying you, and they love me, and I don't have to hide nothing. I don't have to do the dishes. And then sometimes that's what God is saying, like, hey, I, I paid a price for you to be shameless. I paid a price for you to come into the throne room of God, to come and let's, let's conversate, let, tell the truth of what you're going through. Tell him the truth and be vulnerable to God. We can't even be vulnerable to God. Go naked. And I'm not saying naked as a naked. If you want to, that's up to you. But he doesn't mind. He already knows, you know, what we have. So, but just, just he knows. Tell him your pain. Tell him how pissed off you are. Tell, tell him everything. Because I'm going to tell you that we don't have a high priest that he doesn't relate to us. You said, no, Jesus, but you don't understand. I've been betrayed. Oh, okay, so was he. And he knew it. And he invited him into his circle. Into his circle, knowing. And then when he was in the biggest trouble of his life, or when he was about to go to the cross, the, the greatest, the three best friends that he had out of the 12, they all forsook him. They, they left them. Paul said, I don't even, I, I mean, Peter said, I don't even know who that is. And the church is so unhealthy because we have been through a lot. People have talked crap about you. Believe me, in the last three years, I had to deal with my heart, not only from my past, my present, and being as a pastor, and, and, and trying to, like, you need to fully bring, go to God and just tell him. And I feel that the more you're convinced of the word, that the good work that he started in me, he didn't bring me this far to leave me now. And every day I wake up and I say, well, maybe today is the day. Today is the day. I'm going to tell you like, and I'm going to tell you like Monday, I think I woke up okay. Tuesday, I felt like I was like, you know, you're like landing. You know, your plane is landing like, and it's one of those planes that it's kind of old. And by this morning, I woke up with such heaviness. And I had a choice. I had a choice to say, you know what, I'm going to, I'm just going to say, you know, like, I'm just going to admit this is what I have. I'm, I'm dealing with, I mean, clinical depression, if you have versus the most severe depression. But there's no way that I'll be able to get up. And I can honestly tell you that because, you know what, I'm not ashamed. Because I can live, because I can thrive, and the enemy is not going to shame me. He's not. Maybe he had me years back, but I'm sorry. God, the more I go to, the more I abide in the throne room of heaven, the more freedom I get. Amen. And every day we need grace, right? Because we're not perfect. Every day we need mercy. So if you only go once a month, you need to go daily. And many times, three times a day. And sometimes seven. I'm back again, Lord. He's like, come in, come in. Like, he's always, like, so happy. 
He wants to hear from your mouth. Okay, so I'm a parent. My kids are older. And, you know, we as parents, we're always like, being a parent, a mother, and a father, it's never going to like, just because they grow up, it doesn't mean like I love them even more. Like I want to take care of even more. I want them to come to me when they're in trouble. Like, I, you know, like that's parenting. It's innate. It's inside of me, right? But then when I, there's times that Isaac and Alexis, they're talking about their problems, and I feel like I can help them. Like, really, if, if they just will come to me, if they would just come to me. I'm not saying that you should, they should come to me, but I feel when I feel that, I can just imi- imagine our father. When we start talking to each other between brothers and sisters in the faith and, you know what, this is not, this is what God is not doing. I'm not saying that this is what they're doing, but you know what I mean? Like, and I'm like, if we as parents have that desire that our children will come to us, and we have a heavenly father, whether you grew up with a dad or, I don't know, or without a family. You have a heavenly father who loves you. And who has given us the Holy Ghost, the Holy Spirit dwells inside of us. So we can overcome and we don't have to live. Yeah, messes are okay, but they're not forever. Because if not, it has become a vicious cycle, right? We're like, okay, now I made another mess and God is going to... Help me. Yes, he is going to help you, but he wants to strengthen you. He wants to give you the lenses of how he sees your problems so you can get up. Do you know I have a therapist? (laughs) Proud of it. Thank you, Jesus. Because you need people. I know the word. The devil knows the word. But the reason is when we apply it. But you know what? I love it when my therapist says, this is your faith, Virginia. It is your faith that gets you up. And then she gives you like, this issue will take you like 20 years. If we want to like dissect it. And she has able to see God in my life and the power of Jesus and how quick he's working in my heart. But in my heart, I don't think it's quick. So I'm here to tell you, this is your pastor. Real. Because the gospel is real. And you can judge me, and it's up to you. If you don't think I have enough faith, I believe that that's faith confronting your own demons. You're like, you have your own demons. Hey, God has assigned angels to us, and the devil has a pair of crazies following us, and they know our patterns, and they know how to get us because he's not that stupid. He has a plan for our destruction. He has a plan to still kill and destroy. He doesn't just get up and like, oh, let me see what I'm going to do with Virginia. No, he has a plan. So I cannot be like, oh, no, well, the yeah, the blood of Jesus covers me, but I do have an enemy. His, the, the, his name is the devil. So whatever I can, I'm going to do. Because I want this church, I want us to be healthy to help those who are in need. It's stop being afraid of messes. Stop being afraid of like confrontations and conflict this is life until you get to heaven then we won't have that this is our dress rehearsal this is where we do it and I'm so happy that our church is becoming you know I see all different um, races because that has been my prayer I want to see Asians I want to see Anglos I want to see African Americans I want to see people from from ish I mean I want to see every color here and you should be relating to people that they're not your color get rid of that fear go share your story because guess in heaven there is no like they're a white neighborhood and the Latinos are here <laughs> and the Asians are here I bet you'll be with the one that you're like oh no and God is going to say, you know, for six months you're rooming with them. Because <laughs> you can complain, you're in heaven. That was free for somebody. Well. 
many times we see ourselves in the mud. You know, Jesus, God sees us from heaven to earth. And we see things from earth to heaven. But think about it. In Ephesians says that we and I, you and I, if you have Jesus, we have been seated in heavenly places. So when I just stuck in the mud, have you ever been stuck in mud? And you can't get out of it? And you cannot feel God? See, that's genuine faith. When you're able to say, you know what, I don't feel it. I don't know how to get out of here. But I'm going to believe that you are hearing my prayer and that you're looking at my situation, not from my perspective, not from the earth perspective, but you're looking at it from heaven. Because in heaven there is no pain. In heaven there is no sickness. In heaven there is no, there is no addictions. In heaven there is no trauma. In heaven there is no... No, no, that is in heaven. So thank you that you see my life from that perspective. And now I want, I want to see things the way that God sees things. You know, I was just in Texas, and I was, uh, I was spending time with my sister-in-law, and she's an amazing woman. And this is just a side, just a side story. Um, but I just found out that she's colorblind. Do you know how awesome that was? We went downtown. We saw the same colors. It was the most fun I ever had. Like, what color do you see here? And then Alexis was with me. So she's like, oh, that's yellow. She's like, nope. But we were so happy. <laughs> happy. I even bought a new lipstick and then I had to return it because Alexis said, no, it doesn't go with you. <laughs> you know, but I was so happy. Like, there's someone who sees like me. There's someone who agrees. Are we off? Yes. But I'm just saying, like, right? And I might thought, if we just agree with the word of God, because other people, like I'm saying, like, God sees completely different. And I don't know, probably the colors that I see are in heaven. So you guys are going to learn colors in heaven. I don't. <laughs> but it was beautiful just to, to know that there's someone like me that sees like me, that believes like me. And we took just that 30 minutes with going down to, like, every story. What color is this? What color is that? We, we match. And I thought, if we can do that with the word of God and believe, because other people are going to tell you, no. No, that's not peace. What you're going through in your family, that's not peace. That's chaos. But you are so convinced because you're in alignment with God and you're, you're seeing things in a different. No, this is my opportunity that I'm developing my family. This is my opportunity that I'm believing that he is my healer. He is my savior. And you are so like, Ugh. no one can move you. Alexis tried to convince us of all the colors. She couldn't. She's like, guys, this is brown. We're like, nope. You know, God is good. God is good. And he heals all sickness and disease. And he's not afraid of our junk. He's not afraid of our struggles. He's not afraid of our past. He's not afraid of our present. And he already made a way for our future. So out of this, I'm even more in love with him. I am. You know, because in the last three years that I've been, like, deep into this, I, I, you know, when you're in pain, you cry out things that are not in alignment with the word. And I think you should know that. So if you're in pain, if you're offended, if you're a little, a little bit bitter, if you, someone did you wrong, you need to know the majority of, of times that you see life, you're going to see it twisted. If life gives you lemons, you make lemonade. Good thing it wasn't the, the song Lemonade, right? Uh, what was I? That's the problem when the phone goes off. No one knows. Thank you, Mama. Yes, I've been hurt and I have seen things very differently. And this year when I grabbed that scripture and I said, the good work that God started in me, I need to be fully convinced 
and no one's going to convince me, just like I can, if you, uh, my colors, no one can convince me what I see, that's what I want to see, that the good work that he starts in your life, until you go to heaven, or he returns, that's when he's done, that's how committed he is, and Philippians says this, Philippians 1.19 says, for I know, with confidence that this will turn out for my deliverance and spiritual well-being through your prayers. See, you don't have to be afraid to confront our messes. You know that Christianity or people that call themselves Christians, you know that they're more afraid to confront reality? And this is in like, go, go ask Google. We are the most afraid and it started in the garden of Eve. Um, Adam, when he, Adam and Eve were in the garden of Eden, it started there. One sin came in, shame came. Guilt came. And that's what God sent his son, so you and I don't have to live in shame. So we can be, we can overcome. We're not all, I, I, I have met people that, I mean, I've been a Christian for 23 years, but there is still, there's still, reliving the same problem from 23 years ago they're still in the same mess and I don't believe and they might be upset at God because they believe that Jesus is not moving or God doesn't want to heal them but I believe that it's up to you and me to make a choice he has given us a free will and when I remember that I'm like I can't blame God when you start seeing things through the eyes of God, you're able to see that God was with you all the way. That you're still alive because God is good. That your family's still going because God is good and you can get better. If you can just see, I don't know where you are in life, what life has done to you. But if you can just see tonight and you can just see through the eyes of God and no matter how bad it is where you are in life, whether with your family, in your finances, you name it, that you're able to see, I don't know how God is going to do it, but the good work that he started with me in my business, in, me, in my career, in my life, he is going to finish it. And you have to be like that. Get yourself in front of the mirror and say it. No, God is going to finish his work because he is not a man that he should like. And embrace where you are. Sit with your pain. May I tell you that? Okay, don't send me emails. I'm not saying get and live stuck in the pain, but sit in your pain with Jesus. Go through the room, the throne room of grace and sit with your pain. And open your mouth and tell him that reality that you're living, how mad you are or how whatever it is. And you tell him because maybe you cannot handle it, but he can. He can. Because I'm a testament that he can. Oh, he is a good God. Psalms 91, uh, verse 1 and 2 says, He who dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge and my fortress, my God in Him I will trust. God wants to deliver us. He says, He who abides, He who abides, it's up to you. Do you want to abide under His shadow or do you want to abide under your own shadow? If that, I believe that that's what David said that, you know, even though he walks through the valley of the, sh the shadow of death, he wasn't going to fear no evil. Because there's two types of shadows. In the kingdom of darkness, he mimics everything that God has. But if it's bringing fear, if it's bringing doubt, if it's continually bringing like, I'm never going to get out, God is never going to help me, I'm going to tell you that that's the shadow of whatever people have said to you. Maybe you're living in the shadow of your divorce. Maybe you're living in the shadow of a betrayal. Maybe you're living in the shadow of your trauma. Maybe you're living in the shadow. I don't know what shadow you're living in, but I'm here to tell you that you have a choice today to get in the shadow of the most high God. Because his shadow is real. The enemy just comes, and when we are broken and we're on the floor, he wants to kick us. He wants to, and he is so crafty that he will throw all your crap. 
He actually fuels us when we're in pain, right? Like, oh, yeah, I'm being mad at God. And we're like, oh, you know, having coffee with the devil. But then he will, in an opportune time, he's going to use it against you and God. Because he wants that relationship severed. But God is good, and he's not going to let that happen. God wants you to be in your secret place because in his place you are safe in him. And I believe that is your choice to abide. And abide means to remain, and remain means to be live, and to live means daily. It's not just when we're in trouble that we abide on the shadow of the Almighty because he's our refuge, he's our fortress. And he's always with us in times of trouble. Many times when our life is messy, it is easy to dwell from the shadow of, like I said, a shadow of our pain. You know how hard it is to live in the shadow of pain? What could have, should have, but didn't happen? Do you know how hard it is to live from the shadow of failure? Thinking that you're a failure. If I would have been different, things that would have never happened to me. Things da da da. And then you chew on that and you chew on that and it gets bigger. Because the more you do that, guess what grows inside of you? Shame grows inside of you. And shame comes to kill our dreams and comes to steal our faith and comes to steal our belief. God is calling you to abide under his shadow. Because that's where there is freedom. I can't go under his shadow. And when fear comes, when unbelief comes, you choose to say it out of your mouth. I'm going to abide in the shadow of the most almighty God. And then maybe you feel lonely, you feel confused, you feel like every emotion that you can feel, not only in your mind, but physically, emotionally, mentally. And that's the moment that you go to God and you cry out to God. And if you allow him, he will pick you up. He will reassure you that he's with you and that the good work that he started in you, he's still at work. But he wants you to work with him. He wants you to believe God doesn't want you to be self-sufficient. How many times have we tried to do things our own? Because you know what God did? God should have done it. Like, hey, I've been three years. I'm like, oh, come on, Jesus. Three years? You know I'm a pastor, right? And you throw your titles, right, to God. Like, what? And you know I'm God, right? Because we want to put him. We want to we wanna put pressure on God. And, and God is just saying, you know what, Virginia, just sit, just sit under Sit under me. Just, just come and tell me. Just tell me. You know that most moments that I have this, I've received deliverance is when I've been so honest to God. Like honest. Like you even feel ashamed to tell him. But then he's asking, hey, come to the throne room of grace and do not be ashamed. He says no reservation. Your, your speech has to be unreserved. Like just tell me. It's time to speak your truth with God. So we don't point fingers at other people. Because he wants to deliver us. God doesn't want you to feel self-sufficient. He doesn't want you building your own secret place. Do you have your own secret place? We all have our own secret place. We know where we go. You're like, no, I don't go anywhere. No, I'm, t I'm saying you go inward because it's comfortable. You go in there because no one knows your pain and we need to look good. We need to look like we have it all together. How do I know that? Because I've been, I have my own secret place. Okay, let me go cry and let me remember everything. And But that doesn't feed my spirit. It doesn't heal me. But that doesn't mean that God doesn't want me to be frank with them. To be honest with them. And I'm going to tell you that it's the truth that sets us free. And he wants you to be honest with them. Stop pretending. Stop going with all these long prayers and like, eh. no, just tell them about you. 
go and don't complain about your spouse or your children or your finances or what your spouse hasn't done or what your kids haven't done and what you haven't accomplished. No, you go and you go about you. And I'm going to tell you, that's a different conversation. And that's what brings healing. Okay, I'm almost done. You know, we are to guard the secret place with God because that's an, a daily thing. But you know what we guard? We guard our own secrets, our own pain, and let no one in. I bet you there's things that you haven't even told yourself that happened to you. But God knows. And he wants you whole and he wants you healed. Can you imagine that we rise as a church and, and our families are operating in great love and everything that comes out of our mouth is not out of pain it's not out of bitterness but it's out of love that you learn to forgive yourself you learn to forgive others don't miss it next Wednesday I'm going to preach on forgiveness and I'm going to share my um, my journey with you and this is not a journey of 23 years ago no this is a journey of 3 years and I think we need to expose what forgiveness is and what isn't. And that it's a choice. But in our choice, God meets us. And he can heal our emotions. And he can heal the pain because he's close to the brokenhearted. And forgiveness is for you. And we're going to talk about forgiveness and reconciliations because they are two different things. Forgiveness is for you. Reconciliation is between two people. So who's coming? You're like, this is too deep. Thank you for the five of you. Okay, my last scripture. I think I have one more. Can you put my last scripture? Okay, Psalms 34, 5 says, Those who look to him are radiant. Their faces are never covered with shame. You know why we don't share our things? Because of shame. We are so afraid that people are going to let us down. We are so afraid that people are going to use our pain. And they're going to blabber it on Facebook and the church. And, and one thing that I have learned, I told the Lord this year, like, since I became a Christian, I'm not a Christian, but since I became a, a pastor, it has been very hard. I was reminiscing the last decade of my life and what it meant to birth what God wanted in this city and what it meant to die to places in my life that shouldn't never, those places should have never die. And God didn't ask me to surrender those places, but there's a lot of pressure. And there was a lot of pressure for me. I came with two children. My children are still here, but my son was about to be nine, ten, I'm sorry. My daughter was 15, and she didn't even want to be part of this church. But we believed that we were called as a family. And then you came with 12 people. And within three months, six are gone. And then you're like, why? And I had a lot of whys. And I remember just even then entering in such a depression. I'm like, why? Why will God send me? I know we're in the perfect will, but it, this is so hard. And as the church started to grow, like there was such a demand on me to be, I don't know how pastors, female pastors need to look like. But I remember not being embraced. I remember people not even liking my name and telling it to my face. Like, I don't like your name, Virginia. No, that's my name. I will call you Victoria. I said, no, you may not. And, and even then, God was 
delivered me out of this shyness. If you'd have met me 23 years ago, I was the most shy person you would ever meet. And then he calls me to be a pastor, and he wants me to be strong. And, and I was like, oh, it would be nice to be strong with people that love you, right? With people that receive you. But I remember this woman calling me Victoria for the first six months. And then I just had a smile, but my smile wasn't genuine because I was in pain. Because guess what? The enemy was using my past of rejection and everything. And then my son was eight and people expected me to be like, I don't know. They wanted to dress me with long dresses and, and flowers. <laughs> That's not me. That's not me. But you see, I kept that in me. Like, I could never dress the way I wanted to. Because it's too tight, it's too this, it's too that. And like, you should be smiling more. And like, and I think I allowed all of that to build. And one day I just, because doing the will of God is not easy. But I believe that I was many times I was walking alone. No, because Jesus left me is because I couldn't take the pressure. And then I will preach and, you know, I have an accent, right? And uh, people will come in on that, on my face. Oh, we don't receive from women. And so I felt like I just shut my mouth. But I never released it. But it hurt me. And I'm not saying that the church has hurt me. That was just a, a cherry on the top. And I had to come this year and realize, Virginia, you have permission to be you. You have permission to preach how you preach. And I'm not going to lie, and I'm not going to say here, like, oh, my God. No, no, no. Yes, you have a pastor, but I'm overcoming. Yes, do I, I still have depression? You bet I do. And there's other issues yeah, that come from that place. But every day I'm choosing. I'm choosing because I'm believing that the good work that Jesus started in my life. So I, who am I to judge other people? No, life is hard. Ministry is hard. And yet, I wouldn't turn it, even if someone would come in and say, would you go back 10 years ago? And if we choose you to go be a missionary in France, you know, at a place that I like because they have baguettes. <laughs> go to Paris, Virginia. They need Jesus too. I would say no. Because I have got, I've gotten to know my Savior, my Father, the Holy Spirit, while I was stuck in the mud. And how do I know that he loves me? Because so many of you have been praying for me. And if it wasn't for your love and your unconditional love and not putting me in a box. Yes, I do wear skinny jeans. Because I'm skinny. <laughs> you know? I can't think of another. People have told me you should preach like your husband. I can. I have dyslexia. I can't. I can't. He's very like, I'm not. I'm a shotgun. I go everywhere and then I, hopefully I bring you back, right? I'm like, like and he's like, sharpshooter. But I have learned to love who I am. But I learn it through my pain, not in my goodness. So embrace your story. Embrace whatever you are in life and face it with Jesus. And it's okay where you are in life because you're not going to be there. You're not going to be stuck there. And grab scriptures, the ones that I gave you, grab them, put them, get one or two and chew on those. And your bad day, you said, oh, no. 
you know what? God gave me breath, therefore, I can't get up. And I love preaching. Yeah, and my style is weird, so you better follow me on a Wednesday. But I love what I do. And I told the enemy, you're not going to lie anymore to me, to my family, to my church, because it takes one to stand. And I'm going to agree with God that this house will be a house of transformation. Regardless where you are, where you've been, what's coming against you, no, we are going to win because he already won for us.